Hello, my name's Emily. Welcome back to Yoga Off The Mat. This is episode two in this little mini series. First episode, we looked at what yoga is, the essence of why we practice yoga, and I gave a little introduction to the eight limbs of yoga and what those are. In this video, we're gonna talk about the first two limbs of yoga, which are the yamas and niyamas. So these are our moral guidelines, the kind of values that we want to try and uphold as yogis. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and if you enjoy this video, please give it a like, a little thumbs up. That will help me to grow this channel and to reach more people. Okay, so let's get into the yamas and niyamas. There are five of each and if you watch the first episode in this series, you'll know that they come from the eight limbs of yoga. The eight limbs of yoga being an eight step path towards enlightenment. So it's all the elements that make up a yoga practice. We have the yamas and niyamas, these kind of moral guidelines. We have the asana practice, the physical postures, and then the meditation, the breath work, etc. If you didn't see that first episode, I'd really recommend giving it a watch. I will leave a uh, link to that video in the description down below. So first of all, the five yamas. These are our five restraints, things that we should try not to do. The first yama is ahimsa, meaning non-violence, not causing harm or suffering to any beings or to yourself. So this is why a lot of yoga practitioners choose to eat a vegetarian or vegan diet, so they don't contribute to the suffering of animals. The difficult part with ahimsa is that it's not enough to simply go around being peaceful and not punching people and practicing non-violence in that sense. It also extends to the way we think. So if you are being really kind and lovely to people in person, but then in the privacy of your own home, you're saying awful things about them or you're even just thinking awful things about them, then that still doesn't really count as practicing ahimsa. So that's where the tricky part is, is catching yourself in your thoughts and making sure that you're being kind in your thoughts kind in your words, kind in your actions. And we also need to practice ahimsa towards ourselves. So a lot of yoga teachers will use ahimsa as a way to say to people, make sure that you listen to your body, that you're not harming your body by pushing past your limits. So that's a way that we can perform ahimsa or practice ahimsa in our physical asana practice, but we can also apply it to the way that we think about ourselves and the way we talk to ourselves. Then the second yama is satya, meaning truthfulness. So as with all of these yamas and niyamas, on the surface sounds really simple and really easy. We just have to not lie to people. But of course it goes a little bit beyond that. So it's being truthful in your words and actions with other people. It's also being truthful with yourself. And being honest about who you really are. So there's a concept in yoga that we're born as our true self. And as we grow up, there are all these other things that come along that we have to deal with and we put up layers we change ourselves for certain people, or we maybe have one persona that comes out when we're talking to one kind of person and another persona for another person. And it becomes harder and harder for us to access that true self that is within. And the entire practice of yoga is about trying to peel back those layers and get back to our true essence of who we are. So with that in mind, this concept of satya is a little bit more complex than simply not telling lies. Then number three is asteya, meaning non-stealing. Again, on the surface, that sounds really easy. Okay, I just won't go and steal other people's stuff. But, again, it goes a little further than that. In the concept of asteya, it's not just about stealing people's possessions, but it can also be stealing or taking away too much of other people's time, effort, energy in a selfish way. As an example, you may have a friend who calls you up and they want to rant about some problem that they're having at work and they rant and rant and you listen for an hour and then when you go to try and talk about your problem that you're having they don't have time for it and they end the phone call. In the concept of Asteya, that person has stolen some of your time and your energy in kind of a selfish way. So that's what we want to practice with Asteya, not taking other people's possessions, obviously I hope you weren't doing that anyway, but also not taking up too much of other people's time or effort or energy. Then the fourth yama is brahmacharya. And I'm just at that point gonna point out, and I said this in the last video as well, my Sanskrit might not be perfect. I'm sure it's not perfect. So little disclaimer, I do apologize if I am butchering the Sanskrit language. Any Sanskrit speakers, please leave in the comments below uh, corrections and I will try and do better in future. But brahmacharya, 
This is one that has a few different ways of interpreting it. So with all of these Sanskrit words, it's not a language that we can directly translate into English. Sanskrit is a language of sounds, vibrations, and each part of the word has a different sort of meaning. So when you bring all of those parts together, there's more of a, a general sense of what this word means, more of a concept than a direct translation that we can bring into English. So Brahmacharya, for a long time in certain kind of schools of thought in yoga, it was translated as celibacy. And the reason for that is in yoga, we talk about prana, which is something I'm going to talk about in episode four in this series, which will be all about pranayama. Prana is essentially this subtle energy and it's thought of as like our life source, our essence. And we want to preserve that life source and, and keep it within our body. And so this concept of celibacy was the idea that if you were having sex, then you were going to get rid of some of this energy, that you're going to lose part of yourself, your, your spirit, your essence. So that was kind of one concept of Brahmacharya. The concept that people tend to go with these days is right use of energy. So it's the same kind of idea of trying to make sure that how you use your energy, your essence, your spirit, needs to go into things that are fulfilling, things that are rewarding, things that contribute to your well-being, rather than spending your time and energy on things that are really unfulfilling. So a very modern example of this that I always think of is when you're on your phone and you spend an hour scrolling through Instagram or Facebook, and at the end of that hour, you put the phone down and feel really disappointed or unfulfilled, a bit empty and annoyed with yourself that you've spent all that time doing it. Anyone who says they've never done that and spent a ridiculous amount of time scrolling on social media, I mean, you're either lying or you're a much better person than I am because I've definitely fallen into that trap a lot of times in the past. So that we could consider as not the best use of energy. So if we're practicing Brahmacharya, right use of energy, we would try and avoid those kind of behaviors. And then the fifth yama is a parigraha, meaning non-greed or non-attachment. This one's a little bit self-explanatory. We don't want to be greedy. We don't want to take more than we need in terms of possessions and in terms of money. But we also want to try not to become too attached to things. So it's the idea of being able to let go of things when they no longer serve you, when you no longer need them. So this can be objects. It might be that you're um, a bit of a hoarder and you like to keep everything that you find. If you're practicing a parigraha, you would want to try and let some of that stuff go. But it can also be letting go of relationships, either romantic relationships, friendships, or even family members. If that person is no longer good for your own health and well-being, then it may be time to sever that tie and to practice non-attachment. So a parigraha is all about that, is being able to let go of things when you don't need them anymore and also not taking more than you need in the first place. Non-greed and non-attachment. So those are the five yamas and those were our restraints, things that we should try not to do, these disciplines. Then the niyamas are things that we should try to do. The first one is saucha, meaning cleanliness or purification. Keeping the body clean, keeping our possessions, our space, our homes clean. Uh, in our yoga practice, we want to keep our yoga mat clean. If you haven't cleaned your yoga mat ever or for a little while, I have made a video on how to clean your yoga mat. So I will put a little link to that in the description box below as well. And the concept of saucha goes beyond just physically keeping things clean. It's about removing impurities in all senses. So that could be looking at the kind of food that you eat and trying to get rid of some of those unhealthy habits. It could also be confronting negative or harmful thoughts, purifying ourselves on all levels. Then the second niyama is santosha, meaning contentment. And this is the concept of being content and satisfied and grateful for the life that you have right now. We live in a world that is so fast paced and very goal orientated. We're told to look to the future, to set goals and to be constantly trying to achieve and get to the next stage and the next stage. And of course, I think it's great to have an idea of where you want to go in your life and to set some objectives and some goals. However, it's very easy if you do get into that mindset to also get into the mindset of I'll be happy when I make this amount of money or I'll be happy when I lose 10 stone or I'll be happy when, you know, 
I buy that bag that I want. And so we're not very good at just being in the moment and being content with where we are. So the way that I try and implement this in my own life, because I definitely catch myself thinking, oh, I can't wait for that thing to happen. At that point, I'll be really happy. So when I notice myself doing that, what I try to implement instead is listing off things that I'm really grateful for right now. And this is why practicing gratitude complements yoga really well and is a nice thing to bring into your yoga practice because it's reminding you to practice santosha, contentment with where your life is right now. Number three is tapas, and this is not the Spanish food, this is a different tapas. This tapas, similar to Brahmacharya, this has a couple of different ways of interpreting it. The idea generally is a sense of discipline or a burning away of impurities. So in terms of the burning away of impurities, this is in your physical practice, in the exercise that you do, or your yoga asana practice, it's making sure that you put the effort in to actually build some heat in the body. And so you can see how the idea of discipline comes into that as well. For example, if you come into a plank pose and your teacher says, you have the option to lower your knees if you need to. If you always choose to lower the knees just because it feels a bit nicer and it's less effort, then that's not really practicing tapas. So you might try and implement that sense of discipline in your practice and say, actually, no, I will hold the full plank for as long as I can or for as many breaths as it takes. And of course, we can apply this sense of tapas, of discipline to our lives in general. It doesn't mean being really, really strict with ourselves and being really hard on ourselves. But when it comes to those things that maybe take a little bit of effort, but you know you need to do them or you know that you would benefit from them, then this sense of discipline has to kick in for us to do it. Then number four is svadhyaya, self-study. Developing an awareness of yourself, your thoughts, your behaviors, your habits, the way you speak to yourself and to others. Kind of stepping back and noticing yourself, your habits, your behaviors, all of that stuff so that you can see whether it's in line with the values that you want to uphold or not, and whether there are maybe some things that you need to change. And really all of what we do on the yoga mat is a practice of self-study. In terms of the physical body, we spend all this time moving through different poses and figuring out, oh, okay, I've got this little twinge in my shoulder that I need to be careful of, or, oh, my left hip is a little tighter than my right hip. Maybe I need to think about that and balance it out. But there's also self-study in terms of the mind in the way that we respond. So when we are confronted with a really challenging yoga pose, the way that we react to that challenge on the mat tends to be very similar to the way that we react to difficulty in our lives off the mat. And all of this self-study helps us to start removing all of those layers and get back to our true self. Then finally, the last Niyama is Ishvara Pranidhana, surrender to a higher power. I will just point out at this stage for anyone who's unclear that yoga itself is not a religion and yoga doesn't push the concept of God. But there is this understanding within yoga that we are all connected and that there is something greater, whether you call that God or nature or the universe or just pure chance. There's something beyond us that allows things to happen that are beyond our control. Of course, we have free will and we can make decisions for ourselves, but there will always be things that come along that we didn't foresee, that we didn't plan for, that we didn't choose. And if you need an example of that, I mean, this year, 2020, is a perfect example of surrendering to a greater power of something else. Because this pandemic that we're all living through, I don't think any of us would have chosen for this to happen. However, it has happened. It's out of our control. And all we can do really is try and find our peace with it and surrender to the fact that we don't have control over everything that happens in our lives. So those are the yamas and niyamas, the first two limbs of the eight limbs of yoga. This is really the foundation of a yoga practice. So you can be practicing as much yoga as you want on the mat, but if you're not taking these values into your life off the mat, then your yoga practice is never really going to develop beyond the physical. If this information is all completely new to you, if you're just starting to learn about the yamas and niyamas, I'd really recommend in your next yoga practice, the next time that you set aside to get on your mat, you either print out a copy of them or you can grab yourself a copy of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which has that list of yamas and niyamas in it. Um, and spend some time just going through them and having a think about the way that you're behaving, the way you're thinking, and see if there are any changes that you might want to make. 
Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this helpful. Please leave any questions in the comments below. And if you did enjoy this video, remember to give it a like, a little thumbs up, and I will see you in the next one. Episode three is gonna be all about the asana practice, the physical postures. So I will see you then.